What is your life full of? Would you consider your life to be full of worry, of stress, of fun, of joy, of things to do, of stuff? What is your life full of? You know, in this week, as we are embarking upon celebrating Thanksgiving, how many of you like Thanksgiving? I hope you do. I love Thanksgiving. It's one of my favorite holidays. But we're going to be talking a little bit about being thankful, full of thanks, to thank it through and through in our lives, because more often than not, we can be thankless. And that thanklessness actually plays a huge impact on your life and on my life. And so hopefully today and over the next few days and this week, as we think about all the things that we're thankful for, not just think about the things, but specifically think about one thing. That one thing that you and I are called to be thankful for is the grace of God. We're going to talk about that grace, talk about the thanksgiving for that grace, and how that grace permeates absolutely everything. So that's what we're talking about today. Welcome to adult Bible class here online in this way. So glad that you're able to to join us and and, and studying God's word uh, over this, this time frame. So is your life full? How many of you, you got full of stress, full of worry, full of guilt, just full? Something my life that I just realized recently, my life is filled with um, is stuff. I have three kids. Uh, we have, you know, a, a, a nice small house that, that gets full pretty, pretty quickly. And one of the things that gets actually uh, the most full is our, our cupboards. I don't know why. We have five people in our house, and the amount of cups that we have is absolutely ridiculous. We have a, a, a cupboard for these cups right here, these glass cups. We have a cupboard for the plastic cups. We have a cupboard for the, for the water bottles. And let me tell you, anytime there's like a Costco two-for-one sale for water bottles, we have a hard time passing those up. We like water bottles for some reason. We have a, we have a special cup for, uh, for the kids. We have small plastic cups. Then we have another cupboard that's all for like the really nice cups, right? The fine china that we use, I guess, at Thanksgiving, and that's about it. And then not to mention we have cups that are shaped in, in uh, ceramic for coffee and for tea. Our, our house is filled with cups. The cupboards are filled with cups. Maybe that's why they call them cupboards, right? They're to board away all the cups. If, if you're like me, you have a lot of cups in your life. And those cups end up going in the, you know, in the sink, in the dishwasher. And you just have to clean cups. It's constantly what you're doing. And one of the things we did actually this past weekend is we started going through our cupboards, our, our, our cupboards and getting rid of stuff that we don't need. Um, kind of some fall cleaning, uh, if it were. So our table's filled with stuff that we're trying to get rid of, and we'll take it to Goodwill or, or somewhere that can use it. Um, but our lives can be filled with cups, and this is sometimes how we view, so I brought a cup today. This is how I want us to kind of view um, our life. That our life is kind of like a cup, and it's filled with all sorts of different things. Maybe this year, your cup is filled with all sorts of different stuff. So let's just illustrate that. I got got some rocks to fill up our lives. You have worry, you have stress, you have bills, you have all the stuff going on in our world. We got 2020, we got election, we got all sorts of different stuff that kind of fills our lives and our cups feel full. And when we look at our fullness of our cups, sometimes we have a hard time being thankful because how, do you, how can you be thankful when you have no more room? Is, is thankfulness, is it just another thing that you add into the cup? Or is thankfulness something that literally transforms the circumstances, the realities, the burdens, the joys, the worries, the things that fill your life? So is your life full? Or do you feel as if your life is lacking or empty? Sometimes we can feel as if our life life is lacking and and empty, even though we might have full things to do, and we get up in the morning, and we go, and we do, and we work, and we go, and then we go back to bed, and then it's the same thing every day. And we feel full, but we don't feel full. We still have this this emptiness and this lacking. And And I truly do believe that a heart that is shaped by thanksgiving can transform this cup, all the things that we have to do, and view them in a completely different light. To view them through the grace of God and to view them not simply as things to do or pains, but opportunities to understand God's grace and to recognize God's provision and his kindness and his mercy and his presence 
in your life, in my life. I know that I need Thanksgiving. I know that you need Thanksgiving. I don't just mean a holiday where we pause and we eat good food. Honestly, Thanksgiving, the reason why I love Thanksgiving so much is the food is the best food. I mean, like, what, what can you not like, right? I mean, you just put gravy on everything and you're good to go. It's good food. But it's also a really good thing to pause and, and to be thankful, to just stop and to be thankful. But, but the thing that I've always, I guess, had maybe an issue is Thanksgiving should not just be something that we do for a week or even a day in uh, the beginning of the holiday season. Thanksgiving needs to be something that permeates every part of our life. And if it does not permeate every part of our life, we are going to be the opposite of thankful. We are just going to be full. And we're going to be closed off. And we're going to be bitter. And we're going to be angry. We're going to be mad. We're going to be sad. We're going to be impatient. We're going to be all the things we're going to talk about uh, today as we talk about what it means to be uh, thankful. As we get to have that opportunity to thank it through, to live a life of fullness. That's what God wants for you. God wants for a life of fullness in the midst of whatever, however much is in your cup, God wants you to know that his fullness is the thing that allows to transform all of it. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at a awesome book in the book of uh, First Thessalonians to try to help us transform maybe our ungratefulness or disgratitude to gratitude and thankfulness. In the book of 1 Thessalonians is kind of a perfect book for today and for this time because it actually begins and it ends with thankfulness. Paul, the apostle who wrote this book, begins and ends with thankfulness. And so it's a great kind of reflection for your heart, for my heart, for your mind, for my mind today as we try to live out what it means to to be thankful with the things that we have, whether that's good, whether that's bad, whatever that is. So we're going to look at 1 Thessalonians. I want you to grab your Bible, 1 Thessalonians. We're going to start at chapter 1 because like I said, uh, it begins with thankfulness. So I I I want you to see the setup that Paul gives. Because the verses that we're going to unpack are kind of fairly familiar, right? You've probably heard the ones that we've, we're going to unpack later, which is, you know, uh, rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances. We've probably heard that if you've been around church for some time or even fairly new to church. You've probably heard those words before. But we see that the, the foundation for those words, for that encouragement, begins at the beginning. The beginning of First Thessalonians. First Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 1. It says this, it says, Paul, Silas, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. Now I love, uh, when, when we read scripture, I love these types of things. The things that sometimes maybe people might read over, we kind of like more of the application stuff, but I love the, the context and the setting that's going on here, right? Every time, this is, a, this is the letter, this is a letter that Paul and Silas and Timothy are writing to a specific church in Thessalonica. And I love just imagining kind of the relationships. I love imagining this church in Thessalonica receiving this letter from, from their mentors, from somebody that's come through and, and, and given them hope and established this community. And the words that, that these mentors, that these leaders chose to say to them is, is really, 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 really cool. A little bit about uh, Thessalonica. If, uh, if you want to take a look and kind of look at the context for this book, if you go to Acts chapter 17, Acts chapter 17, you see um, the, the context of when Paul, on his second missionary journey, kind of came into Thessalonica and what happened uh, there, what he did there. So um, let's read this real fast. Acts 17, verse 1, When, when Paul and his companions had passed through Amphipolis and Apoll- uh, Apollina, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. As was his custom... Paul went to the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures. So this is what Paul would do kind of on a regular basis. He would go to different cities, and he'd go to the synagogue, and then he would go through kind of the Old Testament, reason through uh, from scriptures. But we see what happens here in Thessalonica after three weeks, right? He's in town for about three weeks. He was run out of town. Uh, as it goes on in verse 5 there, it says, But other Jews were jealous, so they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace and formed a mob and started to riot in the city. So this is the context that Paul is writing to this church. This church that's kind of born in the midst of adversity and is continuing to experience adversity. Actually, one of the main things, that one of the main reasons why Paul is writing this letter is because of persecution that they're facing. 
the troubles that they are experiencing. So I just want you to give that setting for a moment because what are the troubles that you are experiencing? The, the pressures around you that, that, that you are facing. And so the words for them in the midst of persecution and problems and pain and suffering might have some bearing for us in the midst of our own realities of suffering and struggle. And the word, again, is thankfulness. That what Paul encourages from these Thessalonian believers is thankfulness in the midst of struggle. So that is the context. Struggle is the context. If your context right now is struggle, then this word of Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians, is for you to be thankful in the midst of of struggle. And this is what it begins. Verse, verse 2, it says, we always thank God. So he says who they are. It says, we always thank God for you and continually mention you in our prayers. So he writes this letter to the Thessalonian believers and he says, we always thank God for you. And we continually are, are praying for you and thinking about you and praying for you and we're thankful for who you are and what you're doing and what God is doing in your life. Have you ever received a letter like this where someone has expressed thanks to you? Maybe you had a bunch of different things that were kind of filling your life and your plate and you're just kind of being overwhelmed and maybe stressed out and maybe burnt out, but then a simple word of thanksgiving transformed those things and you realized, oh, wow, you were, you're appreciated. You're valued. You're being thought about. That's what Paul is doing here. He's thinking about then and expressing thanksgiving. Thanksgiving transforms even the most difficult of circumstances. Saying that you are thankful communicates something about the grace of God and recognizing the grace of God in other people's lives and in your own life. So this is going to be a challenge, I guess, this week or in general. If you're thankful for somebody, if you're appreciative of them, I'm going to encourage you to reach out, write a letter, send a text, have, pick up the phone, right, and say thank you. Oftentimes, I don't know about you, oftentimes when I don't see that affirmation, right, when I don't hear that affirmation, I can fill in the gap with other things. And my guess is you probably do too. If you have lots of different stuff, lots of different stress, and you don't get that thanks, you, you've been working hard and doing these different things, sometimes you can fill in that gap with other ideas of, oh, I'm not appreciated, I'm not valued. I'm not, I'm not, it, it, it's a, it, it can be really kind of a, a spiral, right? If you've ever been in that place. And so if you have the opportunity, like Paul does, he reaches out and he says, thank you. He models for this church in Thessalonica what it means to be thankful in all circumstances. So that's going to be the challenge. If you want thankfulness around you, you have to first model thankfulness. Because we know the opposite of thankfulness, and we're going to talk about this a little bit later, but there's, there's grumbling, there's whining, there's impatience, there's, there's all sorts of different things that are the opposite of thankfulness, entitlement, right? I mean, there's all sorts of different stuff, and, and, and that can be somewhat draining to be around. So the question is, are you thankful are you filled with something else? And I can't answer that question for you. Only you can evaluate what is it that you are filled with. And the invitation today is to think about, to be filled with, to thank it through and through, and to be filled with thankfulness. Paul makes sure that this, uh, that this church and Thessalonica knows this. And he doesn't just say it at the beginning. He doesn't just say it at the end. He kind of says it through and through it. As, you, as we go on in chapter 2, verse 13, it says, And we also thank God continually. Because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as a human word, but as it, as it is actually is, the word of God, which, indeed, which is indeed at work in you who believe. In, ver, in chapter 2, so chapter 1, starting off, Thanksgiving probably transformed their understanding. Chapter 2, Thanksgiving. Chapter 3, how can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy we have in the presence of God because of you? Paul here models thankfulness in the Christian life. 
all throughout. And so when he's eventually at the end here, he's going to encourage thankfulness. He's modeled what it looks like. The most fascinating thing, the most, I would say the most significant thing about thankfulness is actually what thankfulness uh, means. So th- there's a Greek word. Uh, it's Eucharisto. Okay, that, that's the word that's kind of throughout. And you might hear the word Eucharist in there, right? Which is a, uh, the meal of Thanksgiving or, or Holy Communion. Uh, but Eucharist simply means, it's, 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 it's saying that, that we are thankful for the grace of God, that God's grace is good. It's a Greek word. We're thankful for God's good grace, that God's grace works well. So it's kind of like this. Thanksgiving is... Sometimes when we see God's grace, we see God's grace, we'll, we'll kind of analogize it as, as, a, as a jar here. Remember, like I said, I got lots of cups. This is one of the vases that we're getting rid of. But this is now, right now, filled with God's grace. And, and what happens is we pour in the middle of all the stuff. We think our stuff is full, but the reality is, is that we pour God's grace in our lives. And it fills up. But the funny thing is, the funny thing is, is simply having God's grace... And not being thankful for it is kind of like having God's grace and not being able to see it. We still see, we don't see the water. We see all the struggle. We see that it's filled and we don't see it. And so I would argue that thankfulness is kind of like this. This is going to look kind of cool. I don't know if we can zoom in on this or not. But thankfulness is like this dye that helps us see the grace of God. Right, that helps us see the grace of God in our lives. So when it's poured out in our lives, it permeates throughout the whole reality. And so it turns the color of the things around us. And we're able to see clearly that God's grace is in the midst of absolutely everything that we have going on. Everything, whether that's good or bad or, or painful or joyful, whatever that is, thankfulness allows us to see God's grace. So see life as it really is. Brothers and sisters, you have received the grace of Almighty God that not about what you do, but what Christ has done for you that transforms our life, not just for eternity, but also right now. And thankfulness is recognizing, like this word says, thankfulness, thankful for God's good grace, that we acknowledge that God's grace works well. And actually in in Hebrew, the Hebrew word for thankful is yada. Say that with me. Yada. Sometimes Hebrew is a fun, fun language to learn. I'm not going to lie. But that word not only means thankful, it also means confess. That in Scripture when it says, God, I am thankful to you, it's I confess to you that you are good. I confess that you are good. And so in other words, we're acknowledging who God is. When we are thankful, when we are full of thanks, We acknowledge that God's grace is good. We are filled with his grace in the midst of our life, that it permeates throughout all the different things that we have going on, all the struggles, all the joy, and all the pain. And so now we get to kind of the meat and potatoes of our text is we're going to unpack some specific things that Paul wants for these Thessalonian believers. As they uh, are struggling, facing persecution, facing suffering, probably not recognizing God's grace and just seeing all the different things that fill and all the different things that create fear. Paul says, let me help you. Let me help you with thankfulness. And so I'm going to break it up kind of in, in three separate, uh, separate ways. It's going to be kind of thankful with, uh, with others, with self, and then fullness with, with God. But it begins actually in, in, uh, in verse 12. It says, Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard amongst you, who care for you in the Lord and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard in love. Because of their work, live in peace with each other. Paul's saying that peace is the foundation that I want for you. Peace, I want for you to live at peace with one Another, I want for you to to live in peace. And one of the ways that we do that is we acknowledge the people that are showing us and revealing to us the grace of God in our lives. Do you have somebody in your life that shows you and reminds you of the grace of God? That points you to the truth? Because too often in our lives, what we do is we listen to the lies of the world. We listen to the lies of our own hearts. We listen to the lies of ungratefulness, of entitlement, of selfishness. 
And we don't have anybody in our life that can call us out and hold us accountable and say, you're filling that gap in with the wrong stuff. There's gaps in this area here that your life is not full. You're filling it in with the wrong stuff. So my guess is, my guess is that there are people in your life to challenge you and point you to Jesus. So I'm going to encourage you, like Paul says here, to acknowledge those. It actually means to, 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 to appreciate those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord, who would admonish you and live at peace with each other. This is harmony with one another. If we can't be called out, if we can't be reminded, well, then what we're going to do, we're going to do that spiral deal. We're going to fill in the gap with other things and that are not thankful. We're going to look right over God's grace. And so thankfulness allows us to see God's grace clearly. And so first is thankfulness with others. Thankfulness with others. And it kind of goes through a list of different imperatives. Imperatives basically just means uh, these are important things. These are things that, that Paul wants you, wants me to do uh, with thankfulness with others. And so in uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 14 through 15, it says this. And we urge you, brothers and sisters, we urge you. There's an urging. This is, this is important. Warn those who are idle and disruptive. Encourage the disheartened. Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. Make sure that no one pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. Is that hard to do? I find, I find that part to be pretty hard to do. To, to uh, warn those who are idle and disruptive, that's not an easy thing to do. To warn somebody else. To encourage the disheartened. To help the weak. To be patient with everyone. We have to be patient with everyone. And how, how, are we supposed to, how are we supposed to do this? Well, the, the funny thing is, is you know when, uh, when people in your life are idle and disruptive and disheartened and weak and impatient and constantly striving to pay back wrong for wrong, they are relatively draining. Right? And, it, and if you struggle with those things, you recognize that you feel drained because what that is, that's not seeing, that's seeing the glass, the seeing your life, seeing your cup, seeing the things in your life and not recognizing the grace of God. Not seeing it. Looking right over it. Looking right through it. And instead of being disruptive and disheartened and impatient. So God calls you to as we mentioned earlier, if there's somebody in your life that can call you out, who in your life are you potentially supposed to call out in, in the most loving and Christian-like way, right? To remind them of God's good grace. Maybe there's people in your life, people in your family that are having a hard time with thankfulness and they always, for whatever reason, always just have bitterness and, and anger in their life. And maybe you're called to remind them to be the food coloring, right? To transform the things in their life to allow them to see the grace of God, to see it clearly, and thus to them be thankful for even the things that cause us pain. Because that's the context of Thessalonians, that's the context of your life, that's the context of my life. Pain is a reality, suffering happens. God never promised, He never promised. Hey, everything's going to be great. You follow me, everything's going to be awesome. He actually promised the exact opposite of that. But what he wants for you and what he wants for me is a transformed vision to be able to see all of life through the lens of seeing his grace clearly, which creates thankfulness in our lives and in our hearts and in the lives of the people around us. And I guarantee you, uh, if you have those, maybe those tough conversations, and, and maybe that's not your call. Maybe there's someone in your life that is, you know, just a grumpy guest, and that's not your responsibility to, to call them out. Maybe you have somebody else in your life, and maybe they have somebody else in their life. But if you're in relationship with somebody, and you recognize that they are disheartened, that they are weak, that they are impatient, that they have struggle in their life, you are called to point them to the only place, not just say, hey, stop being grumpy. 
but allow them to see the grace of God. Show them the grace of God. Show them the cross. Remind them of Christ. That's what you and I, brothers and sisters, are called to do. To show other people who Jesus is and what he has done for them. And when we do, when, when we let that be the focus and the center of our, of our conversations and our relationships, that does transform others. That fullness of life, that thank fullness of life, that fullness that we long for, that we desire when we feel drained and we feel empty, we say, God, that is the fullness, the fullness of your grace, that I'm thankful for your grace and other people can see your grace because I've revealed that and showed that and, and, and revealed that to them. I, want to, I don't know about you, but I want to be someone who does that. I want to be someone that points other people to, and allows for them to have, if they are drained, allows for them to have life, the life that God would have for them. And then it moves on with others. It moves on to yourself. That we have thankfulness in regards to our own hearts. That we think about and we see clearly the grace of God that permeates throughout our life. And this is the most famous of this section, right? And you probably maybe even know it by heart. It's rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Now, how are you doing on those? Rejoice always? You sure? Pray continually? Give thanks in all circumstances? I, okay, I, how do we do that? How do you get, get, because oftentimes what we do is we just give thanks in the good circumstances. We rejoice when we're doing okay, and we pray when we need something, right? What, what are those things? And so this is kind of a self-reflection moment where we thought about other people and trying to help other people see the grace of God. What Paul wants for you and for me is for us to remind ourselves to, to, and to allow for our minds and our hearts and our souls to see the grace of God. So in the middle of the struggle of our life, that we would rejoice. That doesn't mean happiness. Rejoice means that we, in in all circumstances, that we have joy that is not located in the highs and the lows of life. That when things are going good, and when things are going bad, that I still have joy because I have Jesus. That no matter what is going on, I have an eternal perspective. Oftentimes, we don't have an eternal perspective. We simply have the here and now perspective. In Philippians 4, verse 4, it says, Rejoice always. And then Paul says, I'll say it again. Rejoice. Right? That's something that we need to do. Do you have joy in your life? Do you see the things in your life as things filled with joy? Or you see them as tasks that you need to check the box? God says, Rejoice always. Second, how do you, how do, you do that? What's, how, do you, how in the world can you rejoice always? Well, a good way to go about that is being in constant prayer. To pray continually or, or pray without ceasing. Now, does that mean, I, when I teach this uh, in, in, in junior confirmation, uh, you know, kids always think, and maybe you do too, right, that does that mean I have to be walking around with my eyes closed and my hands folded all the time? Well, that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense, right, does it? Because then we couldn't get anything else done. No, what God says is that everything that we do, let that be a prayer to him. That we don't just have to pray with our eyes closed. We don't just have to pray with our hands folded. There are times to hit the floor and get on our knees. And this is what God wants. God does want us to be on our knees in prayer. God wants us to be on our knees in prayer. But he also says that you don't just have to be on your knees in prayer. You can pray All the time, every day. But if you're like me, more than prayer, what what I do is I can worry, I can get stressed out. I can try to hold my cup myself. God says, give that cup to me, man. I've taken that cup from you. Give that cup to me. So prayer is kind of worrying in God's direction, right? When we worry, we just simply worry in our own direction and we can't really do anything about it. We have no control, we have no power, we're not God. And so we have no ability to actually affect any sort of change in our lives. We have no ability to, 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 to carry the things in our life. You know, there's a lot of different worries today. 
a lot of different concerns today. And there are a lot of different concerns that, that um, uh, when I talk to students, I say it's good to care about things in the world. It's, it's incredibly good to care about all the different things that are going on in the world, to think through them to carefully, and to care about everything that's going on, to, to, be, to be wise, to be discerning. It's good to care, but you don't have to carry. Our God carries us. And so when we go to our God in prayer, we recognize that he is the only one that can carry the weight of the world, the weight of just simply our cup. We can't carry our cup on our own. And that's actually good news. Sometimes we think that we got we to gotta muscle up and we got to be able to do it, but God says, no. I've actually invited other people in your life to carry your burdens, to carry each other's burdens. That's what the church is. And I carry all your burdens. That's what God does. And so we're in constant prayer, constant understanding of, okay, God, help me see things from your perspective, Lord. Help me understand, help me give the things that I'm holding on to to you, whether that's sin, whether that's guilt, whether that's fear, whether that's worry, whatever that is, God, let me be in constant prayer to you. And I don't know what your prayer life is like. I don't know when you pray. But the challenge for this week, simply going to be pray more. God's there. His ear is right there. And we're able to go to him, the God of the universe, wants to hear from you. Wants you to give your cup to him. And last it says in that section, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. We got a pretty clear picture of what God's will is. That it's thanksgiving in everything. Now, when this is an imperative, this is a command of God, this is not because he needs it, for he needs it for him to be God. No, he wants it for us. Because he knows that thanklessness, ungratefulness, ungratitude, uh, kind of carrying around bitterness is actually bad for our hearts and for our souls. And so God says, because I want you to have life that is full, I want you to see and recognize my grace, I want you to be thankful in everything. To even let that painful memory, that painful experience, whatever that is, to say, let that be an opportunity for you to clearly see my grace. That takes a certain level of spiritual maturity. God doesn't say, do that by your own power. He says, do that by my power. Right? Do that by the power of the Holy Spirit. But thanksgiving actually does change you, there was a study done not too long ago, and kind of they were talking about, I mean, uh, basically the different effects that gratitude actually has on the physical body. I don't know if you knew this or not. These are different effects. that They improve the immune system and lowers blood pressure. Thanksgiving does this. Gratitude does this. Helps you sleep longer and deeper. I mean, how many people take different medicines that help them sleep longer and deeper? Right, it makes you more resilient to recovery from traumatic events and stress. Uh, it, it improves relationships and decreased feelings of Lonely. So gratitude actually has an impact on your life because God has wired you in such a way that he wants you to understand his grace so that you don't have to carry the weight of the world on your shoulders. But you can be thankful to turn your mind and your heart outward. If you're having a hard time with thankfulness, chances are that means that you are kind of probably turned inward. You don't think that anybody deserves your thanks. You don't think that the people around you deserve your thanks. You think that you're the only one that's doing the right thing all the time. And that has got to be exhausting. God says, turn your heart and your spirit and your mind outward. First towards me to be thankful for what God has done, for the grace. And then turn towards other people to say, this is the places in your life where, I am, where you can be thankful for the people in your life that God has placed in your life life. It has impact on people around you, and it is God's will. And we do that by God's Spirit. And so how do we have fullness with God? Thank fullness with God. Well, we pursue Him. Verse 19, we don't quench the Spirit. We don't douse it out. We don't say, okay, I reject this promise of grace. No, we, say, we don't quench the Spirit. We don't, we, don't, we, we don't treat prophecies with contempt. In other words, uh, prophecies primarily being pointing to the person of Jesus. Right, a prophet is someone who speaks the words of God. Prophecy being someone who speaks God's word in your life. If you have people that speak God's word in your life, that speak truth in your life, that point you to Jesus, 
says, don't treat that with contempt, but have fullness with me. Listen to my voice. The world is so loud and so convincing. But I want you to have a transformed life. I want you to recognize my, thank, the, my grace and to see it and to be thankful for it, which transforms life. And it goes on, uh, but test them all. Test all the, the, the prophecies. Hold on to what is good and reject every kind of evil. Reject it all. Hold on to what is good. Reject evil. I think oftentimes in life we have a hard time understanding what's good. And we think that our life is full. And so what we do is we keep a lid on our life. We keep a lid on and we say, okay, I have no more that I'm able to receive or even give. And we keep, kind of keep a lid on our life. And we think that that's going to bring us peace. We think that that's the thing that's actually going to give us peace. The reality is, is that God says, okay, if there's a lid on your life, if you're having a hard time seeing my grace, if you're having a hard time being thankful for the things around you, chances are you need to remove this lid to lean on my peace, lean on my grace, and allow for me to continue to pour my spirit into your life, to allow for me to continue to pour my grace into your life. I'm not going to pour this because that would stain the carpet. But imagine if I did. That's what God does. God continues to pour his grace into your life. And he wants you to see your life through the lens of his grace. He pours himself out for us. That's what Philippians chapter 2 says about who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. Uh, Philippians chapter 2, verses 7 and 8, it says, He made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross.